Back and neck pain, brain tumors, carpal tunnel. The neurosurgery team at Penn State Health St. Joseph Medical Center brings the latest approaches to treating these conditions and more. In fact, our doctors offer complete care in every area of neurosurgery, working together with the entire Penn State Health System. Tonight, we'll hear from patients and their doctors as we learn how we can all get the health we need to live the way we want. Our neurosurgery special, Your Health Matters, starts now. Penn State Health offers complete care for brain, nerve, and spine conditions, making Penn State Health St. Joseph Medical Center the most advanced in the region. And no matter what your condition, we'll consider all of your needs to ensure you receive the very best care. Good evening, I'm Liz Kepner. Tonight, we'll take an in-depth look at spine surgery, carpal tunnel syndrome, and brain tumors. We'll discuss minimally invasive robotic-assisted spine surgery and non-surgical gamma knife radiosurgery. And we'll meet patients and experts along the way to tell their treatment stories of success. And with that, let's send things over to Christina Butler, who is here with our first patient story. Pain can consume our lives if it is left untreated. For one Berks County man, back and leg pain was getting so bad, it was keeping him from his daily activities. One quick surgery and he's back on his feet, now pain-free. Daniel Augustine's family is large and loving, but it was this girl right here, Allison, who led Daniel to realize it was time to get serious about his back pain. The pain had gotten so bad that I couldn't even take my dog out for a walk. Uh, I would take her out in front of the house. As small as she is, she's very strong and she would pull my wife down. So I have to take her out. And oh, the best I could do would be to take her out on my own lawn and then bring her back in. And even that hurt. Just standing up, I couldn't stand up straight. Uh, I couldn't walk more than a few steps before the pain would start. And the, the more I walked, the worse the pain got. Uh, and I, I really was getting to the point where all I wanted to do was sit down all day, every day, really. That's how bad it was getting. This fall, he met with doctors, eventually finding neurosurgeon Dr. Gregory Thompson at Penn State Health St. Joseph. His MRI scan showed really, really tight spinal stenosis. So, and spinal stenosis, stenosis is just a fancy word for narrowing of the spinal channel where the nerves run. So he was having nerve compression or pinching of the nerves in a pretty focal area or, or specific spot in the spine. Uh, there's five bones that make up the, the lower back and his stenosis was between L4 and L5, which is the most common area we see for stenosis. Daniel needed a lumbar decompression operation. So there's five bones that make up the lumbar spine. This is five. So at four and five is where Daniel had the stenosis and so forth. And we like to see a nice curve, uh, sort of backwards curve to the spine and so forth. And in Daniel's circumstance, what was happening is these facet joints here were enlarging and the disc was bulging and this channel the spinal channel was becoming severely narrowed. And, and so in his circumstance, all we need to do then is a small operation tailored right over L4 and 5, basically maybe a little bit more than an inch here to remove this bone and the ligament here and work from inside out to open the nerve channels to take the pressure off the nerve. I had the surgery on September 16th. To date, I will never forget. It took him three hours altogether. But for the first time that same day, I was up and I was able to stand up straight without pain. And boy, was that great. For most patients, they also will report getting out of bed um, uh, soon after surgery that they don't have that pain, that uh, disabling nerve pain going down the legs, that they're able to walk and they start to notice that they can walk more upright instead of tipping forward to try to get relief of that pain. Uh, they're more functional and, and more able to walk and, and just, you know, they feel more comfortable. His staff was fantastic. When I went to get the uh, uh, staples removed, it was his nurse removing the staples. And I was just so excited about being able to stand up straight and being out of pain 
that she said, wait, I have to go get Dr. Thompson. He should see this. So she went and got him and I relayed to him how great I felt and, and he was very happy about it also. It's been four months and Daniel remains pain-free. The only one happier about that than Daniel might be Allison. To be able to go around the block with her and, and it was really great. I, I don't know how I can describe it. I felt so good. It, it was an amazing difference. The pain Daniel had been feeling can be a process of aging, but Dr. Thompson says some people are more prone to it based on their anatomy. Dr. Thompson expects Daniel will continue to be pain-free and won't need any future procedures. Liz, back to you. Thanks, Christina. Dr. Thompson is here with us now to give us an update on Daniel and answer our questions on back pain. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Thompson. Daniel said he got relief almost instantly after his spine surgery. That's really amazing. How's he doing right now? He's made uh, excellent progress after his operation and he's doing quite well. You know, I saw him just after the Thanksgiving holiday um, and he reported to me that uh, his family members noticed he was more active, able to get up and walk around more and was walking more upright. And they were surprised at how tall he was. So that was kind of fun. <laughs> That's great to hear. Uh, we know a lot of people suffer from back pain. What makes a good surgical candidate? So um, a good surgical candidate for back pain uh, really should have tried a lot of the non-operative care uh, treatments first before embarking on an operation. So those usually would require some physical treatment, either physical therapy or the chiropractor, medications, and at times injection treatments into the back. And what we look for in particular is we'd like to correlate the patient's MRI scan, our physical findings when we examine the patient, and the patient's symptoms. We want to be careful subjecting someone to surgery because it is invasive, it does carry some risks, and also there's some downtime to recover from surgery surgery. So we want to make sure uh, that we have the right patient and the right operation uh, is undertaken to help them. And then, of course, we need someone who's younger and healthier and not taking many medications. Those are easier patients to operate on and treat and recover from. But with spinal stenosis in particular, that's a disease of the aging. You know, it happens in folks that are a little bit older. And so sometimes we have to work with their doctors to make sure they're medically optimized for surgery so that they don't encounter any post-operative issues medically while we're trying to get them to recover from the operation. Uh, so many patients of ours are on blood thinning medications, so we have to coordinate uh, a short time of being off those medications uh, where it's safe for them to do so, so that we can get them through the surgery. So what types of surgical interventions are available to treat severe back pain? Sure, and it really is predicated on the diagnosis uh, as to which, which surgery or, or operation should be performed. So in the case of lumbar spinal stenosis, where there's narrowing about the nerve channels and pressure on the nerves, the goal of surgery is to remove the pressure from the nerves to allow the nerves to flow out of the spinal column without any pressure on it. In some patients with stenosis, they also have an abnormal alignment to the spine. So the bones don't line up well. And if their bones have shifted or there's bad scoliosis, they may need additional, not just decompression, but additional fusion procedure to stabilize the spine after the operation. And that is a, a much more surgery, the fusion part of it, and it takes longer to recover from the fusion uh, as well. So well, let's talk about recovery. Um, do most patients do well after spine surgery? And, and what does recovery look like? Yes, I think for lumbar spinal stenosis, um, most patients and in, in, in our literature, that's 65, 70% of patients get very good relief of pain, nearly complete relief of pain um, uh, after the operation. So it has a fairly high success rate uh, and so forth, which we're thankful for uh, because subjecting someone to a big operation and having them recover and have the downtime and the recovery time um, uh, can be involved. So if someone is experiencing severe back pain um, and they've tried almost everything, when is it time to go to the doctor? It's important when someone is having weakness. So the pain is so severe in the leg, you're radiating out of the back down the leg and they, they can't move their foot well or they're tripping because they don't have good uh, foot or leg strength. That's a tipping point for us 
weakness in, in the nervous system. So weakness is telling us that there's too much pressure on the nerve that they should be evaluated a little bit more expeditiously and consider surgical decompression a little bit sooner than later uh, and so forth. Um, the numbness, while it's disabling to the patient, that can come and go and, and we're not as surgeons as bothered by the numbness as the weakness. The weakness is really a tipping point. And then on very, very rare occasions, the patients will lose control of their bladder and that's disabling. So, and those bladder nerves are kind of sensitive and they don't always respond. We like to get to them relatively uh, soon. They don't always respond to us operating soon to remove the pressure. So that becomes somewhat of an urgent or emergent issue. So if you can't control urinating, you're having incontinence and that's different than having difficulty getting to the bathroom. You know you have to go to the bathroom, but you're having difficulty getting there is one thing, but not being able to control going to the bathroom and having incontinence, that's somewhat of an emergency. So you wanna call your doctor right away or go to the emergency room to have them evaluated. Wonderful advice. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Coming up, the overwhelming experience of a brain tumor diagnosis and the latest care for carpal tunnel syndrome. Stay with us. Welcome back to our special, Your Health Matters. I'm Liz Kepner. Our next patient story starts with a frightening diagnosis of a brain tumor. Brain tumors range from harmless to aggressive, and early detection is key for the best outcomes. Christina Butler has more. Donna Kerper beat breast cancer in 2013, but years later, her cancer returned, this time in her brain. With the help of technology that could pinpoint exactly where the new tumor was, her craniotomy was successful and as minimally invasive as possible. Donna Kerper doesn't let much slow her down and always has an idea of what she'll do next. I'm busy all day long. I have a fireplace. Uh, sometimes I've split my own wood, carry it in, carry, you know, all day long. Um, I do yard work, I have a garden in the summertime. <laughs> but in 2019, the 63 year old was left with little control of what would happen next when she had a sudden seizure. I had no symptoms at all. The day before I was up in a tree stand with a rifle. I came in to write out Christmas cards and I had a seizure. I never had one before, I never wanna have one again. And I waited till it was over. I went to the neighbor and the other neighbor, nobody's home, drove myself to St. Joe's Hospital. And in the emergency department, she had a generalized tonic-clonic seizure. She was given medications to stop the seizure. And then she went on to have a number of diagnostic evaluations, including a head CT and MRI of the brain. And they showed us that there was a metastatic tumor in the left frontal lobe. And that means a piece of tumor, some cell, has sailed up a blood vessel and parked itself at one place in the brain. In some unfortunate circumstances, it's showered and there's multiple places in the brain that have tumor rests. In this case, it was just one. The cells came from Donna's previous breast cancer. You can have no symptoms. You know, I thought my cancer was arrested. I was stage three on diagnosis back in 2013. I had radiation, I had chemotherapy, I rang the bell, you know. Little did I know, what, five years later, six years later? She's admitted to the hospital in the care of our hospitalists and oncology, neurosurgery, neurology, the whole gamut of subspecialties required to care for her uh, weigh in, get the imaging studies or diagnostic tests that are important. If somebody has a cancer, and now they have a presentation in their brain, well, maybe it spreads somewhere else to a liver 
or to their spine. Within the week, Donna had surgery to remove the lesion. Imaging was obtained so that she could have a surgery that was also guided with a stereotactic uh, navigation so that we take the information from CT and MRI images, feed it into a computer, and that surgery can very precisely locate the, uh, the tumor. Now, this is very helpful if somebody has a tiny tumor that you have to have a very selected location for. In her case, it was just so to precisely open the, the head, doing the craniotomy, so that just the tumor area brain was exposed, no extra brain, so to know exactly what the tumor is as you're making that approach and to understand how far you are within the tumor so that you don't go uh, into more normal tissue. Surgery was a success, but Donna and her team of doctors wanted to take no risks. When you have that procedure done, I know that I could take out, in her case, everything that I could see looks abnormal, feels abnormal, and that the imaging guidance suggests that it's abnormal. But there's not a precise razor thin line between normal brain and tumor tissue, so we know that there are cells left behind, that there is the potential for regrowth in the brain anyway. And it usually requires subsequent care. So that's where our radiation and medical oncologists come into play. Donna handles the continuing treatments the way she handles everything else, upbeat, ready to go, and grateful. I'm not gonna let it get me down. I'm not ready to check out <laughs> by any means. I have a daughter, a grandson who's 10, he thinks of the world of me and I of him. You know, you have to trust your doctors. I trust my oncologist. I trust uh, neurology. You know, I hadn't met Dr. Weaver before then, but, oh, his, his bedside manner, uh, his demeanor was excellent. You know, I could talk to him one-on-one -on -one he was down to earth. The whole team was down to earth, not aloof. So it made it very, very easy. I found everything I would need at St. Joe's, Penn State, St. Joe's and Penn State Hershey. Why go anywhere else? They're supportive, they're um, innovative. They listen to what you say, they're professional. And they have time to treat you good and treat you as a friend. You heard Donna mention Penn State Health Hershey Medical Center there. Because St. Joseph Medical Center is part of the Penn State Health System, Donna was able to get seamless, specialized care at Hershey. Liz, back to you. Thanks, Christina. Dr. Weaver is here with us to give us a patient update on Donna and tell us more about brain cancer treatment. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Weaver. I'm sure a brain tumor diagnosis is very scary, but treatments are more advanced now, like in Donna's case. Can you talk to us about that? Uh, brain cancer diagnosis has to be scary for any normal person. <laughs> no, no one wants anything like that. But brain cancer diagnosis, um, use the word, you use the word cancer, and this is a word that is a scary word. But brain, if you use the word brain tumor, the brain tumor could be a variety of types of pathologies of growths in the brain, some that are aggressive, angry, almost unstoppable, and some that are so very slow growing that we do nothing except watch them. Location, location is the important part of how symptoms occur in brain tumors. Not all brain tumors present the same way. So what are the signs and symptoms? Well, the presenting symptoms really depend on the location, but it also depends on the rate of that tumor's growth. Uh, sometimes by the occurrence of hemorrhage that can occur with some certain tumors, not all, and also by their cellular and vascular nature that could influence the way a tumor irritates surrounding brain. In uh, the case of Donna, she had a tumor that caused a lot of irritation of the brain. So the function of the brain was poor, well, distant from the area of the smaller tumor. Uh, so let me explain it better. If a tumor grows as an area of primary motor cortex, a place where the neurons and 
brain cells are really, really dense and do important motions like make your hand work, then something very small could be symptomatic. Whereas there's other places in the brain, such as in the frontal lobe, that has more to do with um, insight, um, cognition, personality, and behaviors like that. Well, something can grow to a larger size before it becomes symptomatic or recognized. If something's slow growing and benign, like something, a tumor called a meningioma, can occur and grow extremely large without the patient's awareness until the brain runs out of um, ability to compensate and it can't give anymore and then becomes rapidly symptomatic and images obtained and you go, oh my dear Lord, how large is that? Why didn't we know that long ago? So the speed of growth, the cell type, if a tumor hemorrhages, all those are causes for presentation that different one to the other. So Donna got amazing treatment and everyone at Penn State Health worked together to give her the care that she needed. You know, having the whole Penn State Health system behind you working together has to be something really incredible, isn't it, Dr. Weaver? Yes, it sure is. And you know, right here at Penn State Health St. Joseph, we have our medical oncology and radiation oncology specialists that we work with every day work very closely with to care for all of our cancer patients. Most patients with brain or, or spine uh, pain, uh, problems require evaluations and treatments by both of those oncologic specialists. But sometimes we need more advanced imaging, more treatments, including devices or technologies not available here at St. Joseph and Reading. And as part of the Department of Neurosurgery at Hershey Medical Center, we have easy access and communication and referral to our colleagues at Hershey Medical Center for such care and in Donna's case uh, for gamma knife radiosurgery. So it's important to treat the entire patient and not just the brain tumor. How does your team work together to offer the patients the very best patient experience at Penn State Health St. Joseph? Well, I think communication with the patient and by everyone with the patient and among ourselves is the the, the hallmark of good care, because without communication, we miss things, or the patient is not fully aware of their plan. And failure of knowledge is a difficult thing to bear, particularly in an acute care setting with acute thing happening like a brain tumor. All of the different things that you do, you're absolutely incredible. You're amazing. And we thank you so much. And thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for the invitation and opportunity to be here today. I enjoyed it so much. When we come back, we'll talk carpal tunnel and treatment options for the most successful outcome. Stay with us. Welcome back to our special, Your Health Matters. Carpal tunnel syndrome is another condition for our specialized neurosurgical team at Penn State Health St. Joseph Medical Center. And while physical therapy and lifestyle changes can help alleviate symptoms, surgery is sometimes the best treatment. Dr. Thompson is back to navigate us through this condition. Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for joining us again. A lot of us have heard of carpal tunnel, but what exactly is it? Thank you. Uh, Liz, for having me, but uh, carpal tunnel is where uh, there's pressure on this nerve called the median nerve, and it runs down the palm of the hand and through the wrist, kind of in the center of the hand, and that's why it's called the median nerve. And so it's compression of that nerve that can give a patient symptoms into the hand. And usually they'll complain of pain into the thumb and palm area of the hand towards the thumb, into the index and middle fingers. Sometimes there can be tingling or dysesthesias, that unsettling feeling of tingling and so forth into the hand. Uh, and uh, oftentimes the patients will describe weakness in their grip, having difficulty opening jars and controlling the hand. 
And then what's particularly disabling for some folks is it'll wake them from sleep at night. So here they are trying to get some rest at night and they're plagued by waking up with this misery in their hand and they have to shake their hand out or try to manipulate their hand or some folks will run cold water over their wrist or hand to get relief. And so uh, after a few nights of this, they're ready you know, to call the doctor and find out, geez, what's wrong uh, and so forth. So, um, but that's basically carpal tunnel syndrome. What is the best way to diagnose carpal tunnel? So most of the time, if you call your doctor, they'll invite you in to, to, for an examination and to go over the symptoms you're having. And it's fairly easy to examine a hand and diagnose this just by physical examination. So for surgery, you know, before we do an operation, we like the patients, of course, to try a wrist splint and some anti-inflammatory medicines or non-operative care for because many patients will get better without surgery and, and with non-operative care. For those that have persistent symptoms, we recommend an electric test. It's an EMG test, and it basically helps us discern where in the nerve is the breakpoint or the pressure on the nerve to confirm the diagnosis. We don't want to go on a fishing expedition through someone's hand and arm to find where the problem is with the nerve. And for most patients, it's in the palm surface of the hand is where the compression is. And that's one of the most common surgeries done in the United States on the hand is this carpal tunnel release procedure. Now, I think a lot of people uh, will be surprised to hear that this surgery is actually performed by a neurosurgeon. So yeah. why is that? <laughs> yes, that's a good question. I think our society tends to equate neurosurgeons with brain surgery and so forth. And while this is not brain surgery, we're all trained in the surgical treatment of the entire nervous system. And the median nerve is a peripheral nerve in the hand and one that we're all taught early in our careers uh, to treat and take care of. The procedure, what does it entail? Yeah, I think the best way to think about the procedure is to, to sort of, I'll use my hand here. This part of my hand, there's a U-shaped tunnel, and that U-shaped tunnel is made of bone. And the flexor tendons that pull the fingers in flexion and that nerve run through that bony channel. On top of that bone is this thick ligament. We call it the transverse carpal ligament that presses down on those nerves. And some patients, and this is why the the problem is more common in females because they have a narrower, their bones are not quite as big and the tunnel is a little tighter or narrower. And, and that ligament will thicken over time with repetitive use and so forth and cause pressure on the nerve. So at surgery, what we do is a small incision in the palm surface of the hand and we go down and find that ligament and just open the ligament. And that takes that bony circle, if you will, and makes it a bony U and opens up the channel for the nerve. And that's the simplest way to describe what we're doing. And the surgery is an outpatient surgery. It takes me 20 minutes to do the operation. It's not a very big procedure. And um, the main risk points, you know, we're working around the nerve. So we worry about that a little bit. We're working around tendons. We worry about those a little bit. And then there's always some blood vessels that are in and around the area. But for most patients, it's uh, come in, have a little bit of a day surgery. Now the hand is an important component to our daily lives. So we put a little bulky dressing on and have the patient use that leave that on for about four days uh, and then take that off, wash the hand with some soap and water, leave it open to air. Because this is such an active surface of the body and for most of our lives, we've gone through um, uh, without thinking about using our hands, we just use them. Um, we do keep stitches in the hand for two weeks or so. And at two weeks, we take those out and then we gradually ask the patient to continue to start to use their hand more fluidly and so forth. Wow. You could do this entire show, Dr. Thompson. <laughs> I could listen to you talk and talk and talk. Thank you so much again for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. And that's going to do it for us here tonight. As always, you can find the very latest information on our website, pennstatehealth.org backslash st hyphen Joseph. We also want to remind you that if you are experiencing symptoms that require medical care, please don't wait. Reach out to one of our experts now to get an appointment scheduled. On behalf of Penn State Health St. Joseph Medical Center, we want to thank you for joining us. Have a great night.